Day this is today. I bet you you haven't thought about it a lot. Today is Saint Agnes's Day. Now Saint Agnes was the Virgin uh, Saint of Virgin, and she uh, and if you and if you were improperly slept uh, and followed certain procedures, you would uh, you would have dreams of your future husband. And so this is so young young girls were very very anxious to uh, go to sleep on St. Agnes Eve to find out who they were going to marry. Anyway, it's traditionally the coldest day of the year, and so the eve of St. Agnes, which was last night, is usually traditionally the coldest time of the year. So I just checked that out, and I found out that um, Chicago, the all-time low in Chicago. Uh, or average all-time low in Chicago is on January 20th last night. So that, that's, uh, this would vary widely depending on what part of the world you're in, but it's in England it was the coldest night of the year. Now, uh, also I forgot to mention some, something last week I wanted to throw in here as an addendum. You know, we talked about uh, the importance of tea gardens in England particularly in the 1600s, the most famous of which was a tea garden known as the Parthenon, where women would invite men to give them tea. I forgot to tell you about another innovation uh, in the tea gardens, and that was they'd have a box. And on top of the box, it would say, to ensure prompt service. Get it? to ensure prompt service tips so it, it's it's out of it's out of tea gardens that we get the concept of giving tips and uh, typically they don't use boxes anymore but that's a very uh, kind of a formal way of doing it anyway uh, I want to talk today about sugar and, and uh, chocolate now this is a vast subject and uh, I won't be able to do, get, do, do uh, uh, diligence with it. But I do want to talk to you about the history of sugar and its importance and how it came to be such a, a valuable commodity. They called it white gold because it was so uh, almost priceless at one point, uh, refined, what we would call refined sugar, which is very readily available today was not very readily available in the, in the old days. Uh, it came, of course, from uh, sugar cane. Now, sugar cane was indigenous somewhere in the Polynesian islands. They uh, it, it and it started to make its way west. Polynesia um, was a was apparently the start of it, but then from there. It moved uh, west. Uh, and one of the places it took a big uh, foothold was in India. In fact, the word sugar is a uh, word as is candy. Both those words come from Hindi. And, uh, and it gradually made its way farther and farther west. And of course, in the Middle Ages, the Crusaders came across sugar and they were like so many people enamored with it. People were at first enamored with it as medicine. It's odd for us to think of sugar as a medicine. Yeah, yeah think of it almost as a toxic substance today, right? Uh, particularly refined sugar, but, but they thought of it as medicine. In fact, in the Quran, it mentions that tea, if, uh, uh, that if you have tea and sugar, tea and honey, that this is very beneficial to you. Now, um, you know, we, we should, in passing, say what, what, what the background was for sugar coming into the Western world. 
Up until sugar made its appearance, honey, of course, was the thing. And honey, honey was, uh, has always been a, a wonderful substance with much value, but it's also very difficult to deal with, right? It, it's, uh, viscosity is very thick. And so, uh, honey has a kind of interesting history. The um, Christian, uh, early, uh, early, early on in uh, European <coughs> Christian history, they got the idea that um, all queens were virgins. Now, this is a little hard for us to understand, but there was no king, let's put it that way. Yeah, huh? Yeah, so they came, they came to the idea of virgin. Therefore, they would make their candles out of beeswax, and only on and, and religious candles, candles that were used in church had to be made out of beeswax. Of course, this created a huge industry for, for honey and beeswax. And so much so that there's a, ch a church day that is well known. It's called Candlemas, which means the mass of the candle. This was the day on which the beeswax candles were dedicated. People would bring their candles in, and the candles that were going to be used in the church had to be anointed. And this was done on Candlemas. Candlemas is 40 days after Christmas. Now, what happened on 40 days after Christmas? Carolyn, can you catch the door? Uh, 40 days after uh, Christmas, Mary brought Jesus to the temple to be anointed in the temple. And she made an offering. Now, why is this so important? This is so important because this marks the, the day in the church year when Jesus officially becomes uh, 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 what's the word we would say you would say in Christianity baptized there's another word I'm using for, looking for in Judaism but anyway th this was the moment that he enters into the community now and uh, so if Mary had a girl it would be 80 days they, she would be ritually un, Mary would be ritually unclean for 40 days until the 40th day then she could brought Jesus to the temple then she could go home and be with her husband again uh, but if it's, a, if it's a girl it's 80 days now, this gives you an idea of the relative views of men and women in that era so this was the day they celebrated Jesus coming to the temple, but they called it Candlemas, the mass of the candles. Now, um, it's, it's awfully important to understand that it took a long time for them to learn how to refine sugar from sugar cane. Basically, what they would do is boil the sugar and they'd come up with this gooey mess that didn't, wasn't very helpful out of that uh, the byproduct of course of all this is called molasses now molasses was huge beef, beef, uh, in in uh, as a low cost sweetener it was uh, i'm sure somewhere in your life you've had molasses something right uh, at least molasses cookies but molasses is hard to work with like honey but it was cheap because it wasn't considered that valuable but the one commodity they made from molasses was, anybody want to take a shot at this? It's called rum. rum. And rum was hugely important. The, so important that the British Navy, it was part of the daily ration. A half pint of rum. Now, a half pint may isn't a whole lot, but then it depends on how strong the rum is, right? And uh, so rum was important. And it was eventually called grog. G R O G Grog, and uh, this is named after a general, uh, I should say an admiral, who uh, Grogum, who uh, allowed the the sailors to have their grog, but it, it's really rum, and rum rum is still uh, a huge industry, uh, I should say. Now I want to want to tell a story here about sugar cane, sugar refining. That's un quite amazing actually there were there was a man in 
Louisiana. He had a plantation. And I want to write down his name because, see if I can find a pen here. I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure that you've ever heard of this man. His name was Norbert. He's, Well, you, well, you, you can't really quite do the French, you, you, but well, you, Norberg, Kirsby, Nor, Norberg, Norberg, well, you in French. So that, that's the way he was known. Now, what's, what's important about understanding this man's connection with sugar is, first of all, he is a Creole. Again, a much, a very confusing and misunderstood word. The word Creole originally applied only to Europeans, such as French and Spanish, who were born in the New World. Let me repeat that. If you, your parents were French, but you were born in Louisiana, you were considered Creole. That is to say, second class citizen. If your parents were wealthy enough, you would take the boat back to France, have the child, and then bring the child back to the French. So in Louisiana society, Frenchmen were the highest caste, and then the second caste were Creole. Now, Creole also comes to refer to the food that uses Native American uh, 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 fruits and vegetables and, and so forth, such as corn. No, no Frenchman in his right mind would eat corn on the table. I mean, you know that, right? Corn, corn is exclusively for the use of pigs. And uh, so if you ate corn, they, they, they would literally call you a pig. And, uh, and the Germans are this way, too. Good luck going to, say, Germany. Go to those European countries, have a very bad attitude toward corn. And, uh, but, but all of these things that came from the New World, corn, tomatoes, green beans, squash, pumpkin. I mean, think about Thanksgiving meal. The, the point of the Thanksgiving meal is all, that everything is indigenous to America, right? So you have the turkey, indigenous, you have the, you have the potatoes, you have squash, you have sweet potatoes. You have um, uh, beans, for example. Even even the uh, chocolate and even the uh, vanilla uh, that might be used for, in the whipped cream. All of these things are indigenous to the New World, right? Well, anyway, back to uh, so these are called Creole foods, and the Europeans, when they came, took them a long time to accept these foods. We think. Of course, nothing about it, but uh, that's because we're all, in, in a sense, Creole. We're all born in the, in, the, in the world. Now, however, here's what happened to the word. The word um, transitions itself to, me, instead of meaning uh, people that were born in the New World, comes to mean people who are the product of marriages between classes. Right? In other words, if, if, if a Frenchman marries a Creole, then the child is automatically Creole. But, uh, but if, a, if a rich person uh, marries somebody outside their social <coughs> class, particularly if that person is black or Hispanic, that, that's moving out of your social class. So these then become Creole. So Creole in, in Louisiana today has to do with what we'd say are mulatto people, people of mixed race, right? And uh, so the Creole people is very uh, strong up in uh, northern Louisiana in Natchitoches. In Natchitoches, they have the, the, the first a church, the first Creole church in America is built by these people. Now, it's, if, you, if you know Louisiana culture well, you realize you have the elite 
plantation owners and, and also uh, rich people. Then you have uh, you have the, in the second class, these people, many of them are rich and own property and so on, but this is the Creole class. And they're, they're, very, um, they're very much historically second class citizens. And uh, eventually, uh, before the Civil War, they were called free people of color. So they, they, had, they had some freedom, but not unlimited freedom. Anyway, this man here, Norbert, was a Creole. His father was Frenchman, his mother was a free person of color in Louisiana. Now, he might be the most famous Creole that ever lived. And I make this case in this way. He invented, uh, he had his own plantation, he invented uh, and patented the multi-effect evaporator. Now what this is, uh, is, is an automatic sugar refining system. Before making sugar, they could do it, but it just required step after step and a lot of manual labor, and, and the slaves were very much involved in, in, in moving these uh, containers, and they would be boiling hot, and they would get burned, and I mean, it was just, it was just awful. And Norberg, back in the 18... Uh, 40s, again, this uh, before the Civil War, he um, he invented, made this invention. Of course, he made a fortune from this invention, and it became adopted by sugar makers, cane sugar uh, refiners all over the world. And so, all of a sudden, now white sugar, which is expensive and hard to get, becomes mass produced and becomes cheap because of this Creole man. Now, here's another oddity of history in Louisiana. Probably the most well-known Sephardic Jew in American history, there, there haven't been many Sephardic Jews in American history, so this isn't real tough, but anyway, maybe the one that people, that reached in some ways very high stature, was a man named Judah P. Benjamin, okay? So Judah P. Benjamin, is a real important uh, person in our story. I think there's an H here on the Judah, Judah P. Benjamin. Now, the Sephardic Jews, just, just so you'll know what we're talking about here, the Sephardic Jews were Jews uh, from the south, from the Mediterranean world. The word Sephardic means Spanish, Spanish Jew. And they spoke a language called Ladino. And they came, th there have always been some Sephardic Jews in American Israel, very, very few, the vast majority probably 80 or 90 percent of all Jews that came to America are, are Ashkenazim. The Ashkenazim are what we say is German Jews. They spoke a combination of Jew, German and Hebrew called Yiddish. And uh, in Dallas here, for example, the Ashkenazim community was huge. And uh, uh, the Nemans and the Marcuses and the Sangers and the Harris and so on. Um, all these well-known Jewish families in Dallas, these are all Ashkenazim. And uh, this, this is true in New York, uh, Macy's, and you know, so forth. Uh, Hollywood is made up entirely of Ashkenazim. Uh, the, uh, they built their own empire out there, we call it the movie industry. And uh, it, it is very, very important to understand that the very few Sephardi Jews, but anyway, uh, Judah P. Benjamin was a Sephardi Jew, and he, he was a lawyer. He trained at Yale. Remember me telling you how Yale came into existence? And he moved, he moved to New Orleans because it was a good opportunity for them to be a lawyer there. And he became very, very successful in uh, Louisiana. He was a United States senator from Louisiana. I believe this is the first Sephardic Jew, maybe the first Jew 
of any kind in the United States Senate. Anyway, Norbert Ballou and Judith P. Benjamin were very close personal friends, spent a lot of time together. And uh, they both had, uh, this is odd in a way, because what does Judah P. Benjamin go on to be? He goes on to be, when the Civil War starts, in 1861, he goes on to be the Attorney General for the Confederacy, and eventually is elevated to the position of Secretary of State. One of the very highest positions in the Confederacy is held by some part of Judah. Now, yet here's his best friend, is this Creole man, back in Louisiana. And so this, again, is part of the uh, irony and paradox that comes in understanding how racial relationships were in the South and in Louisiana in particular, right? And, uh, but the idea is one of the reasons that they may have gotten along so well is they never quite accepted Judah P. Benjamin in their social circle because he was a Sparta Jew. And they never quite accepted Norbert in their social circle because he was a Creole. And they knew it. I mean, the thing, everybody knew everybody's status. That's the most important thing. Now, moving on to the history of sugar, we, we need to mention beet sugar. Cane sugar was dominant until Napoleon needed a substitute for cane sugar. And they started experimenting, and a French scientist came up with the idea of growing beet sugars and refining them. And beet sugar then started to dominate, and eventually, well, under Napoleon, uh, they had only beet sugar, because they, they, the British blockaded France, essentially. And it wasn't until after the war that cane sugar started coming in, it was actually cheaper than uh, beet sugar because it was produced in what way? Slave labor. And so they could uh, undercut. So beet sugar went out of existence until the 1850s. The Mormons are out there in Utah, and they, they're far away. They, you know, the cost of bringing products to Utah was enormous. They had to you know, have these huge oxen caravans, and they, they carry sugar, and it was too expensive. So they decided to try beet sugar. They experimented and, sp and experimented, and eventually uh, started to uh, be successful with beet sugar. And uh, it was in uh, 1902, they set up a huge operation called UNI Sugar. Has anybody ever heard of UNI Sugar? Years ago, uh, UNI Sugar was huge. It's been, you know, long gone now, but uh, UNI Sugar was Mormon um, uh, operated because it was very valuable uh, commodity to have refined sugar out west so they didn't have to import it. It was extremely valuable. And eventually the whole west goes to be sugar, uh, particularly in Colorado and um, in, in other places in the West. Now, anyway, um, during, the, um, during the Second World War, the Nazis couldn't, they were blockaded also, so Hitler had a big campaign for beet sugar. So they started growing massive amounts of beet sugar and, and simply were able to uh, get the, you know, the whole, get, get all the sugar they needed, uh, plentifully, uh, plentiful supply indeed. Now, uh, I want to talk to you now, uh, transition over for a little bit in the chocolate, but we're not, we're not really leaving sugar here because the main ingredient in chocolate, as you all know, is sugar. And so we'll talk, of, we'll talk about this kind of together. Um, Chocolate, of course, is a New World product. They found it, Cortez found it, when he went to visit the uh, Aztec, uh, found that uh, Montezuma was drinking chocolate. And uh, so he tried it, and he took it back to the Holy, Ro Holy Roman Emperor, who was uh, also the king of Spain in Seville. Seville is the great center for uh, the Spanish uh, New World connections. 
And um, the Council of Indies, for example, was located in Seville that controlled all the Spanish uh, colonies. Well, anyway, he introduced chocolate to uh, uh, the, the, uh, the King of France, a holy roller emperor who's named Charles V. Now, this is the very same Charles V who uh, interviewed Martin Luther and uh, had his, the, the famous diet, at the famous Diet of Worms. But he, Cortez offers him chocolate and he likes it. So then chocolate drink then becomes a, the drink of the royalty. Why? Well, it's very expensive. And, and so only the aristocrats and royals can have it. Now, the man, uh, th this is interesting. There's a man who I don't know if you've ever heard of. He's the father of taxonomy. Taxonomy is the, the, the discipline of naming things, uh, or, organisms, and so forth. His name, he's a Swedish man named Linus. Last name, Linus. Now, Linus is, is a really interesting guy because he came up with all these categories. It was Linus who came up, used the phrase homo sapien, and he said, that Homo sapien was a primate. Now, this is amazing because this is in the 1700s, right? This is 100 years before Darwin, and he says humans are primates. Well, anyway, his connection with chocolate, he gave the, the, the official generic name, if you will, scientific name for chocolate is Theo Broma. Theobroma. Anybody want to take a shot at that in Latin? Theo means God. Broma means food. God's food or food of the gods. Right? This Swedish guy up there working, you know, more or less by himself up in Scandinavia names chocolate the food of the gods. And when he did this, he knew nothing of chocolate bars. He only knew the drink, but they loved the chocolate drink, and it was very, very, it was a very, very big deal. Now, anyway, uh, chocolates had a very fascinating history. One thing that I'm particularly uh, got into was this this idea that chocolate became popular right away, and uh, in the Catholic Church, it became a big dispute whether or not chocolate could be drunk during the fast. Now, there were many, many fast days, particularly in medieval times. There were many, many fast days. Uh, and, and of course, every Friday, uh, you were to not eat, not need anything uh, meat-wise, but you could eat fish. And so, you know, fish on Friday and all this. And also sometimes, <coughs> uh, these fast days were days in preparation. So, for example, Lent, 40 days. Some people would fast the whole time. They, that, now, that's a fast, right? Uh, more than a month and a half. Uh, now, a real fast, you would think, would be water. That's it. But for over 10 centuries, the church had allowed wine during the fast. Okay, so this this you can you can kind of see that in a way uh, uh, whether or not wine has great nutritional value or not. I think is now that's that issue has been settled. But back then they didn't see any nutritional value in wine. The same with chocolate. So th there was a huge controversy of whether or not chocolate could be drunk in the fast, and it was. Uh, the, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits had been formed in 1534, Ignatius Loyola, and the Jesuits were very much out in um, on mission, in mission fields, and one of the things that the Jesuits were particularly uh, good at is that is gathering up chocolate beans and selling them. Mark, this is one of the ways 
that they survived, particularly in South America. The Jesuits, of course, have their own unique history, and uh, Jesuits got very, very crossways with the church authorities. So, so in 1773, the Jesuits uh, were abolished by Clement the Fourteenth. And here's, again, one of the great ironies of history. The Jesuits would have been completely wiped out, except they established, they had schools in Protestant countries. They were in Switzerland, they were in Germany, they were in Holland, they were, they were in Poland, which at that time was Protestant, later became Catholic again. And uh, so they argued that chocolate, now we're talking chocolate drink here. The chocolate bar had been invented. And they, they, argued, they argued that it did not break the fast because it had no nutritional value at all. Now, on the other hand, the Dominicans, who were also great missionaries, uh, they argued that it did break the fast. So um, Pope Gregory XIII finally settled this, and then six popes after that said that chocolate did not break the fast. So there was a big chunk of history in there where the chocolate was allowed during the past. But eventually it got uh, thrown out as one of those things. Now, chocolate is, is a, important because it comes, to, um, it comes to be one of the three key drinks in England. Uh, they had, briefly, they had chocolate houses uh, but most typically they would have coffee houses that also served cho chocolate. Uh, these were served because before 1700, tea was too expensive. Can you, can you imagine? Tea was more expensive than chocolate or coffee. <coughs> but after 1700, tea becomes very inexpensive, and that's because of the what? The East English... Um, um, East India. East, there it is. It's the East, I believe now. British East India Company. In other words, they, they just controlled the eastern half in the beginning. Eventually, they controlled the whole country. But that's when they had that huge, we'll call it a shrub, 14 feet high, uh, 14 feet thick. No, let's see. 14 feet high, 12 feet thick. And it ran 1,200 miles oh, yeah. uh, to keep people that could only pass through certain places, and there they would have to pay the tax on the salt. Remember that? Well, then uh, ultimately the British tried to control and do control tea and pepper <coughs> and salt. Those three. And uh, the, but interestingly enough. Uh, they're in the tropics. They could have grown, grown chocolate, but they didn't. You know, chocolate came from the New World, and there's still some chocolate growing here, but 80, 70, 80% of all the, all the chocolate in the world comes ultimately from cacao trees, cacao seeds, plants, I mean cacao uh, beans that are from Africa. So it had been transplanted to Africa, and that's where it's been most successful. Now, so in these in these um, these coffee houses and tea houses, they would um, 